Mr. Paulson, recently Secretary Henry Fowler stated that the American economy is in grave danger. What would you say some of these grave dangers are? Well, the greatest danger at the present time, Mr. Mack, is the uh, inflation factor. Uh, in order for the general public to understand the actual condition of our national economy, it's necessary to prepare a balance sheet or a profit and loss statement on the overall economy, the same as you do on a, a corporation or an individual business. Right. And in doing so, it will enable us to know where we've been, where we're at, and where we're headed. And anyone that will take the time to audit the official records of the United States government, now, this is the economic report of the President of the United States, which is published annually and transmitted to all members of Congress. And this publication contains all of the statistics on every segment of our national economy. And all we have to do is audit these records and prepare a balance sheet and a profit and loss statement, the same as a corporation or any other business. And when we do, we know the exact condition of the national economy because our national economy is nothing more than the sum total of all of the component parts, all of the corporations, all of the small business, professions, uh, taking agriculture as a major unit, all of the wages that are paid. When we audit these records, it enables us to know exactly the condition. And when Mr. Fowler was referring to the grave crisis that lays ahead, I don't know exactly what he was referring to, but I'll tell you what we refer to when we say that the national economy is in grave danger. First of all, uh, the economy now for the past 17 years has not been a profit economy. Every year it becomes more and more profitless for the private enterprise segments uh, to meet the operating costs of running our economy. And as a consequence, we're operating on debt expansion rather than the earned capital necessary for capital expansion to put up the buildings, the plants, the machinery, the equipment, technology to keep this fantastic economic system of ours operating. And to give you a general idea of the condition of the national economy, I have a little chart here that illustrates the increase in just the federal debt from prior to World War I, going back to 1917, up to the present time. Now, you'll notice that before World War I, right. we practically had no federal debt whatsoever. During World War I, our national debt increased. But then you'll notice that after World War I, we liquidated a great portion of the federal debt. And this is the way we liquidate debt is through a depression and through repossessions and liquidations. This is when the property that was once yours now became the property of someone else that was reclaimed. And then you'll notice in the beginning of World War II the way the federal debt began to increase. And it increased. And it increased. And this is the way that our federal debt has been increasing ever since. Well, now the economists tell us that we're not supposed to be concerned about the debt because we owe it to ourselves. So what do you say we take this enormous federal debt and dump it in the ocean and forget about it? It's non-existent. And when we're at it, let's take the debts of all of the 50 states and dump them in the ocean. We'll take the debts of all of the large cities, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, Detroit, and all of the other large cities across the country. We'll throw those debts into the ocean. And the debts of all of the towns, the cities, and villages, all of the county debts, all of the township debts, and the debts of all of our schools, wipe them out. What do we have left? We have the debt that will bankrupt the United States, the debt that Congress and the general public pay no concerned to whatsoever. And this is the private debt, because we're operating in a private economy in the United States, and we have to be concerned about the uh, financial condition or the economic condition of the private enterprise system if we're going to have a true picture of the condition of the overall economy. 
And so the question arises, how much longer can the private enterprise system in the United States continue to finance the fantastic debt expansion that's been going on in the United States for the past 17 years? Well, now we've prepared a profit and loss and a balance sheet on our national economy. And through our research, we discover <coughs> that private enterprise at the end of 1967, this past year, was er only earning 57% of the income necessary to meet the wage and interest costs of operating our economy. In other words, private enterprise was being shortchanged 45% of the income that it must have in order to meet the wages, the interest costs, and taxes to keep the economy moving. You mean it was 45% then? Short. Then 45% short. This is certainly uh, a figure that the American economy should be concerned of its grave danger. Right. Now, here's <clears throat> what's happening. As a result, if you'll check the official records of government, you'll discover that from the end of 1965 to the end of the third quarter of 1967, that the corporations in the United States added almost $100 billion to their debt expansion. This is for new plants, machinery, and equipment. And yet their income only improved $400 billion. This is only an increase of one half of 1% on a $100 billion expansion program. Well, how can the corporations even pay 1% dividends to stockholders with a performance like that? It's impossible. Now, this has been going on for 17 years, and it isn't only the corporations or the small business. <clears throat> But agriculture has also been the victim of this profitless society that we've been uh, living under. And I'd like to let the <clears throat> uh, viewers see the performance of our national economy and the private enterprise system since 1950. <clears throat> You'll notice that this chart illustrates the income of all of the private enterprise segments of our economy from 1950 through the present time. Now, this chart shows the increase of the various segments of private enterprise from 1950 through the end of 1966. Every inch on this chart, now get this, every inch on this chart represents $10 billion. Now, from 1950 through 1966, the net interest uh, profits increased from $2 billion to $20 billion. The increase in rental income of persons increased from $9.4 billion to $18.9 billion. Farm income increased from $13.5 billion to $16 billion. Small business profits increased from $24 billion to $41.8. And the income of corporations increased from $24 billion to $48 billion, $100 million. Now, this is the income of all of the revenue-producing segments of our national economy. But let's look at the other half of the ledger, the half that the general public seems to know very little about. How about the increase in the fantastic debt? Well, I'd like to unfold this chart and show you what has happened to the debt expansion during this same 16-year period. And I'm talking now about the increase in our gross <clears throat> public and private debt. Now, the red lines will indicate the increase in this debt over this period of time. And it's almost staggering as we unfold this chart. And please keep in mind that every inch of this chart represents $10 billion. Mr. Elliott, I wonder if you'd hold this chart for me for a moment and if, see if you can get it stretched out. Maybe you can walk back a ways. Well, we ran out of cardboard when we prepared this and found it necessary to add all of this to this chart in order to get the debt expansion on this record from 1950 through 1966. Now, this is the debt that the people of the United States have accumulated from 1950 through 1966. 
and this is the economy that we have been bragging so much about during the past 16 years. This great prosperity that we've been told about has been nothing but debt expansion. And from 1950 through the end of last year, we added $1,100 billion to the public and private debt. Thank you, Mr. Paulson. We'll be back just one moment for a further interview with Arnold Paulson. U.S. Farm Report, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this area and others interested in having American agriculture receive cost of production plus a reasonable profit. The American farmers and ranchers are building a brighter future for agriculture through the National Farmers Organization, the organization that awoke America and represents the leadership of agriculture. U.S. Farm Report features private enterprise with guest Arnold Paulson, research analyst from Granite Falls, Minnesota. He has been past president of Minnesota State Junior Chamber of Commerce and past Americanism chairman of the Junior Chamber of Commerce of the United States. Mr. Paulson, a businessman, also heads the Citizens Congress for Private Enterprise. Here to do the questioning is Lee Elliott and Don Mack, assistants in public information for the National Farmers Organization. Mr. Paulson, you've been traveling around the country quite a bit, holding economic seminars, talking about the economy of the nation in rural America. Red, when did you first get interested uh, in this? Well, actually, I've been interested in agriculture all my life because uh, as I grew up as a boy, my father was involved in uh, the retail grocery trade, and I, at that time, knew the value of agriculture, at least to the economy of our community, because at that time, the farmers would bring in their, their eggs and home-churned butter and things like that, and this is what they used to buy their groceries. And, of course, all my life, I've realized that agriculture has been the uh, basic foundation of the economy of rural America. But I didn't get really concerned about the fantastic impact that agriculture has on our national economy until about five years ago, when I became very much concerned in industrial promotion and industrial development. And I've read many of the surveys that have been prepared on various communities by many of the uh, engineering counseling services, and all of the reports that I saw were all one-sided. All they ever pointed out was the advantages that the community was going to receive through industrial expansion, but never would they emphasize the cost or the losses involved in attracting this industry. So I decided it was time to prepare a balance sheet on industrial growth from a community to decide exactly or discover exactly where a community obtains its new wealth and the effect that new industry has on the well-being of all of the people in the community. And of course, I ran this survey first on my home county, and the second survey I conducted was on the richest agricultural county in the state of Minnesota. And to my amazement, I discovered that, such as my community, if we were going to live off our basic industry alone, <clears throat> that all we could earn would be approximately $400 a year per person. And that was very startling. And so I wanted to find out where the rest of the income originated. I searched every crook and corner in the community. I couldn't find it until I went outside and took into consideration these hundreds of small industries that we call farms. And I found that the average family farm contributed four times as much to the per capita income of our community as our basic industry. And that's when I began to realize that I'd been working on the wrong side. <clears throat> what would you say then, Mr. Paulson, that the standard of living actually is based on today. Well, the standard of living in any country, Mr. Mack, is based not on the number of dollars that the individual earns, but the standard of living is based on the production of goods and services and the ability of the people to share and to enjoy these goods. The standard of living in the United States is not the number of dollars that we earn per hour, or per week, or per year, but it's what those dollars will purchase. <clears throat> Uh, it's the bathtubs, the automobiles, the type of home, the balanced diet, 
This is our standard of living. And this is where so many people become deceived. And this is why in, in America, under our private enterprise system, <clears throat> we have created the greatest standard of living that the world has ever known. And the thing that I'm afraid of today is will we destroy this standard of living by liquidating the greatest industry that the world has ever known, American agriculture. Well, you're probably one of the greatest ambassadors that the private enterprise system have today. What uh, basically is the difference between private enterprise and the term free enterprise? Well, we hear a lot of talk about free enterprise, <clears throat> and actually I don't think anyone can really define it because we all have our difference in interpretation. There isn't anything that's free. You can't get into business free. It costs money. Uh, actually, what they mean I, uh, by free enterprise is I believe they mean free from government. And if we're going to be free from government, then we're talking about private enterprise. And what we have in the United States of America is not free enterprise. We have private enterprise where the business and the industrial units are owned by the people, either by an individual or by a group of people. And this is what we call the incentive system that's <clears throat> given mankind the incentive to, to produce and to become the greatest producers that the world has ever seen. Now, free enterprise, as some people interpret it, would be uh, the law of the jungle. No, no laws, no regulations, no restrictions, no tariffs or anything. The survival of the fittest. The fittest. And this is the law of the jungle. And I don't believe we have anybody in, in this country that actually wants that. We want the freedom to be able to run our own business and to be gainfully employed. And this is private enterprise. And uh, we do have this misinterpretation, Mr. Mack. Red, uh, uh, I've heard it said a good many times, uh, uh, well, a little comment about the world prices. Like uh, here in America, if the farmer was to get a fair price, uh, that he'd price himself out of the world market. Uh, do you care to comment on this? Well, that's impossible. Because here in the United States, we have the lowest farm prices in the world. Uh, the United States of America is the only country in the world that bases <clears throat> their entire farm production on a world surplus market. Now, if you check the records of uh, farm commodity prices in the common market countries, you'll find that they're all much higher than ours. Corn will average at least $2 and a quarter a bushel where it's five in the United States. <clears throat> now, what we mean by the world market is not the market in Germany or England or France. The world market is the surplus market of all of the commodities of the world on the London Commodity Exchange. And the United States of America is the only country in the world that prices all of our farm commodities at this low level. Now, when we export, our farm commodities to the common market countries. And by the way, the common market uh, nations are the largest importers of American exports. And we have to pay a duty or a tariff to bring these, our farm commodities into those countries. In other words, if we want to bring our dollar and five cents corn into Germany, we have to pay the differential and tariffs on our dollar and five cent corn to their price level which is approximately 100% of parity of what farm commodities should be selling for in the United States. Now, who gains? The government of that country gains because they include these tariffs in their budget. And so actually what we're doing is subsidizing those countries with our exports. And it's ridiculous because these other countries are willing to pay the price that they should be paying for these commodities because it will stabilize their market. And what we're trying to do through this free trade agreement in the Kennedy round is through free trade is to destroy their market level. Now Germany as an example has maintained 100% of parity for farm commodities ever since 1950. What is the standard of living then over in Germany with this 100% parity for their agricultural well, pr products. Well, one thing that we'll discover as we analyze the German economy is that they haven't added $1,100 billion to their debt during the past 17 years to buy their production. Now, if any country in the world today should be debt-ridden, it should be Germany due to the fantastic rebuilding program that uh, 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 recovering from World War II. But Germany doesn't have the debt. 
and Germany has a solvent economy and they're growing and they're prospering. And yet during the same 17 years, what have we done in the United States? We've permitted our farm prices to drop from the parity level of 1950 to now 50% of parity. And for every dollar we've underpaid the farmers since 1950, we've been forced to add $2.10 to the debt. What is this doing to private enterprise? What is the parity now for private enterprise here in America? Well, private enterprise is only earning approximately 55% of the income that it must have in order to meet the wage and interest costs of operating our economy. Mr. Paulson, uh, I see that you put out one of the, the nation's leading uh, newsletters called the Arnold Paulson Newsletter, and you seem to be very well informed. Just uh, what is your solution to the national and rural economic problem? Well, I wish there was a different solution than the records bear out. But unfortunately, there is only one solution to our economic plight. And that's the restoration of the farm commodity price level to 100% of parity. And the reason for this is that the gross income of agriculture is the greatest contributor to the new wealth that's created uh, in this nation each year. 70% of all of the basic raw materials that are consumed by the entire United States each year are the food and fiber products that are produced on the American farm. And after all, income is nothing more than production times price. This is the income for the laboring people, the income for business, the income for agriculture. And our national income is nothing more than the total productive units uh, throughout the nation times the price level. And in order to restore the national income to the level that it must be to meet the operating costs, we have to restore the price level of 70% of all of the basic raw materials that we use. And so it's nothing more than a pricing mechanism. And if we'll restore the price level of agriculture to the parity level where it belongs, we'll generate $7 of national income for every dollar that we increase the prices of agriculture, and business and industry in return will earn one dollar in profits and savings as a result of this. And there isn't any other way of solving our national economic problem other than restoring farm prices to 100% of honest parity income. Now the question is, how are we going to restore farm prices? In other words, who's going to bell the cat? Well, our problem started with government. And so unfortunately, there's very little hope in converting Congress to restoring farm prices to the level where they belong because we've got a consumer oriented administration and Congress today where the consumer is receiving all of the preference. And yet we're operating in a private enterprise system here in the United States. And every other business and industry in America uses the pricing mechanism. When you go into an automobile dealer to buy a car, he prices that automobile. You go into a jewelry store to buy a watch, there's a price tag. Now this is the American way of doing business. When you go to the uh, automobile shows, General Motors doesn't call all of the dealers in every day and have an auction on their automobiles to find out what they're worth like we do livestock. They know that they have to have cost of production plus a profit or they can't stay in business. And agriculture is the only industry in the world today that I know of that's operating back in the Stone Age in their marketing structure. And it's time that agriculture starts becoming businessmen, like American industry and American business, and price your production. Now, how are you going to do it? Well, it's very simple. Your organization's got the solution. The National Farmers Organization. Well, I don't care what you call it. But unless farmers will band together their production, like the National Farmers Organization is advocating, and pooling all of the production on a national level and say, now this is the price, the American people are going to pay it. And it's just that simple. We do it in every other business. The baker does it. The candlestick maker does it, but not the farmer. Well, now as I uh, talked with uh, one of your officials uh, uh, earlier today, uh, he outlines that this is all that the farmers are trying to do. But it's a new concept in agriculture, just like the combine. And so it's sometimes very difficult to get farmers to see the light. But 
until the day comes that farmers will price their production the same as every other business, it will be impossible to restore equity of income to agriculture. There's only one thing wrong in agriculture today, and that's income. Well, how do you improve the income of agriculture? You can only do it through improving price. The solution is for the farmers to have enough common sense to figure out what their commodities are worth and price it and get it. It's just that simple. And this is, I understand, what your organization's all about, isn't it, Mr. Mack? Yes, sir, that's right. Actually, the National Farmers Organization is legally organized and operates under the Capra Volstead Act, which was the legal structure that was set up by Congress some, well, way back in 1922, which gave the farmers the right to ban their production together as producers and producers only under a collective bargaining program to get this one thing, and that is for fair farm prices. And of course, this is what we're trying to establish, fair farm prices, stabilize the farm prices under a contract. Well, Andrew J. Boston happened to come from my hometown, Granite Falls, Minnesota. Well, we have more than one thing in common then. Uh, Senator Capper came from my home state. Well, wonderful. I happen to live about uh, four or five doors from uh, uh, the Andrew, uh, the Andrew Volstead residence back in Granite Falls. And I've read and studied the Capper Volstead Act, but I'll tell you one reason why. The NFO has captured my enthusiasm and attention. Now, I'm a businessman, not a farmer. And I believe in the private enterprise structure in the United States. And I have no quarrel with the other organizations or with the cooperatives, believe me. But one thing that I know that the National Farmers Organization is not going to do is you're not going into competition with my business. This is right. You're not going into competition with Main Street. That is right. And for this specific reason, every single businessman in the United States should take the time to study the program of the National Farmers Organizations for their own benefit. And once they've analyzed the program of the National Farmers Farm Organization, Farm Organization. Farm. collective bargaining program, they can't help but support you because this is what they believe. Mr. Paulson, I'd like to quote here just one moment. We're running close out of time. But this was taken from a publication from the Farm Chemicals entitled Government and Your Business. It says, upshot of all the talk about farm bargaining is that 1968 may well, may well go down in economic history as a year of farmer bargaining through know that NFO started the trend eight years ago. It is important to note that the connection with the new official blessing acquired by NFO, that its type of bargaining is the only one that does not require new legislation. I agree with that. I agree with it 100%. It's a pleasure having you on the program, Mr. Paulson, and thank you very kindly. It's been a pleasure for me. U.S. Farm Report has presented Private Enterprise with research analyst Arnold Paulson from Granite Falls, Minnesota, with Lee Elliott and Don Mack doing the questioning. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week at the same time for more facts on agriculture and rural America, which is the gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth. The farm income pattern sets the nation's prosperity, and the National Farmers Organization represents new thinking in a new generation of agricultural producers.